Hello, this lecture will cover pages 165 through 172 of my lecture notes. Please print those pages out and have them in front of you as I present this lecture on flip-flops and related devices. Part D, the delay flip-flop and its applications. Starting on page 165 at the top, besides the SR and T flip-flops, we will also discuss two more types, the delay or the D flip-flop and then finally the JK flip-flop. These are two of the most important flip-flops and they are used in most medium-scale integrated and large-scale integrated circuits. First of all we want to look at the delay flip-flop. This is how it's built. This is the block diagram and this is the truth table down here. I want you to notice that besides the clock it only has one input. Now if you take a look at this basic construction it almost looks like the clocked SR flip-flop but it only has one input instead of having to set in the reset the reset down at the bottom is really the top set term that goes through an inverter so there's there's no reset input down here for the de delay flip-flop all the delay flip-flop does and it's probably the most easiest to understand is it delays the output for, for, for the the input to the output by one clock period you just set up what you want on the D input. If you set up a zero when the clock comes, you'll get a zero out here. If you set up a one when the clock comes, you get a one out here. It just it just memorizes the input when the clock comes. Um, how does it do that up here? Let's take a look. If if the D input is a zero, if this is a zero, there's a zero placed on this top gate, and it'll put a one. On the output of that inverter, that is a zero one in an S in a clocked SR flip flop. It's a zero up here and it's a one down here. Notice that what that's going to do when the clock comes is put a zero out here. It's going to reset it. What if the D is a one and this bottom term is going to be a zero? The the S term, in other words, is going to be a zero. If you look at the gated SR flip flop, a one up here and a zero down here basically just puts a one out here. The one when the clock comes goes out here out to this point. So notice that the input NAND latches have three inputs in them because they they incorporate what they call asynchronous inputs for preset and asynchronous input for clear. So these two signals here are low active preset. If this goes low you'll preset this to a one and this will be a zero. If this goes low you'll it's a clear. When this signal goes low and they bring these out on the pins, these are pinouts. When this goes low down here, the output will clear. There will be a zero here and the Q bar will be one. So let's take a look at the block diagram here. Notice that this inverter eliminates the ambiguous or the state that's not allowed. These can never be a one and a one because of the inverter right there. If there's a 1 here, there'll be a 0 there. And if there's a 0 there, there'll be a 1 here. This is a clock edge device. So it's a positive clock edge device. There's our edge detection that works on a positive edge. Has one input, D, besides the clock. It has your Q output, obviously your Q bar. And there's your asynchronous preset, and there's your asynchronous clear. These here are called asynchronous inputs and may be applied any time between clock pies clock pulses. There are no ambiguities in this D flip-flop. So let's take a look. If preset is inactive and clear is inactive, if D is a 1 on the nth clock when the clock pulse come, what's the output at QN plus 1? It's a 1. This 1 gets delayed by one clock pulse to here. If preset and clear are both inactive, you have a 0 coming in when the clock edge comes. What's on the N plus 1 output after the clock pulse you get a zero that zero just is memorized on the output zero I don't care what's on the input there I don't care I don't care whether on the nth clock pulse you have a one or a zero it doesn't make any difference if the preset is low it's a low active preset the output goes to a one on the n plus one pulse it presets or sets the device if the clear is low you can see how it does it up here. Pretty easy. If there's a low here, you get a one there. If there's a low there, you get a one there. These are NAND gates. Don't even have to look at the truth table for a NAND gate if you memorize the symbol. 
the way I told you the second week of the semester. Makes this real easy. That's why I tried to drill that into you back then. But if the clear goes low, if the asynchronous clear goes low, you clear the output. That's all the possibilities for the D flip-flop. What about applications of the D flip-flop? On page 166, delay flip-flops are used to create registers. Registers are temporary storage areas used to hold data in digital systems. You can see the specification. You can get out, I'd get out the 74, 74 chip. It's on page 283 of the spec. Get that page out. And you'll see that the 7474 is a dual positive edge triggered D flip flops with preset and clear that we talked about. So if if you want to make an 8 bit register, there's there's they're dual. There's only two in each package because you have more pinouts. You can't get four of these in there like you can NAND gates. You sure can't get six of these like you can inverters. So you need one, two, three, four of them. That'll be your A0, A1, A2, A3, A4, A5, A6, and A7. That'll form a, a register to hold a byte. Or you put eight of these together and you can hold two bytes. Here's your 8-bit register output. What does it look like in a block diagram down here? There's your 8 bits coming from memory. It's your data bus. It could be your tri-state data bus. Here is your four 7474 packages. Here's your clear. Nope. Here's your clear and here's your preset. They all get tied together, by the way. Your presets will all get tied together here. Your clears will all get tied together. So there's only one clear input, one preset input. And your clocks all get tied together. And here's your output. This output is shown down here as 8-bit data bus to memory. And we call that an 8-bit accumulator. You can make a general output register of 8 bits. You can make a buffer register of 8 bits. One of the most popular, pop, popular registers in a microprocessor or a microcomputer chip is the accumulator. And this is exactly how they build it. On page 167, you can see uh, delay flip-flops used for parallel transfer of data between two digital circuits. I only use three bits here, but here's register X, three bits. And here's register Y, three bits. See how you tie the clocks together? When the transfer pulse comes, positive edge trigger, these are positive edge triggered D flip flops. You know how to read that. This is real nothing more than the clock. When that positive edge triggered comes, it takes this data here and puts it into that register Y. It takes from register X on the on the transfer and it transfers three bit output. To register Y. Pretty easy to understand. Delay flip-flops can be used for serial data transfers one bit at a time. Here we have an X register and here we have a Y register. And notice we're taking the output to the input and the output to the input. And we're taking the output of the X to the input of the first Y. The output of Y to input and the output of Y to input. So here's our 3-bit bit X register and here's our 3-bit Y register. Three shift pulses results in the contents of X going into the contents of Y. It explains this down here. It's real easy to see. Here's our shift pulses. We're shifting, we're shifting these three bits here, whatever they are, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, whatever. We're shifting these in from register X, these three bits into those three bits. You can make this a four bit to four bit transfer, whatever, but we're doing it one bit at a time. That's a serial transfer as opposed to a parallel transfer up, up above. On page number 68, we're going to talk about delay flip-flops to synchronize an asynchronous control signal. Here we have a switch that's debounced, and this, this switch, this mechanical switch here can be thrown at any time. It's, in other words, this point A is completely asynchronous to, the, to these clocks. Because you can throw, this point A is going to go high. You throw this switch at any time. There's no relationship to the clock. If you take a look at what happens here, you can create partial pulses depending upon when you throw this switch. Here's the asynchronous input. We threw it here. And we got a little tiny, creates a little portional, partial pulse here. Full pulse, full pulse, because it's an AND gate. And then another partial pulse here. How can we synchronize signal A with the clock? 
we just use a D flip-flop. We put a D flip-flop in here. Run the clock, positive edge triggered, run the clock to the flip-flop and to the output gate. And look at the timing diagram now. You can th This pin A can go high at any time. Pin A, this signal A rather can go high at any time. You're still throwing this, very asynchronous to this, but you synchronize, this output gets, gets synchronized. How does it do that? Well, the D flip-flop just holds that up and waits for the clock to come before it gives an output to enable the output, to enable the clock on the output. And notice what you end up with th is with three complete pulses. Now, you may have a possible setup and a hold time problem on this. The engineer would have to take it into account, those setup and hold times I talked about. But that's how you can use it to synchronize an asynchronous control signal. My favorite example E here, or E on page 169, delay flip-flops can be used to detect an input sequence to determine which signal occurred first, A or B. We don't know. Here's a temperature signal. Here's a pressure signal. Uh, signal. A and B can represent anything. And, and, and yeah, we're making B the clock, but you'll see why in a minute. And if you want to know whether A comes before B or B comes before A, notice how I labeled the output signatures here. This is high active. A, if this goes high, I know A was before B. If this goes high, Q bar, I know B was before A. This circuit will do that. An engineer designed this years ago, and many people use it. Let's see how it works. Here's signal A. Signal A clearly goes high before signal B. We're looking at the output Q now. We're looking at the output Q. So if signal A goes high, and then the clock sig the B goes high, B acts as the clock, and it clocks A to the output. And as soon as Q goes high, that tells you A was before B, and it surely was. What about if you have this scenario here? A st stays low, and B, the clock, which is the clock, it goes high. The output a gets delayed and it comes to the the, the the a signal gets delayed by one clock period to the output zero and q is zero if q is zero this is an active but q bar is a one which says b is before a and surely b was before a that circuit works here's the one example here's the other example this could be this signal could be temperature greater than 80 degrees, and this could be pressure greater than 1,500 pounds per square inch. And you need to know which one of these happened first in, a, in an operation. This will tell you that. Look that over. And then F, delay. this is on page 170, delay flip-flops used to create shift registers. Shift registers kept... Shift registers can be used for many purposes. You can read this. Shifting data, here I have binary 8 bits, number 44 and base 10. I shift it to the right, divides in half. Shift it to the right again, divides in half again. That's one, that's one fourth. Shift it again, one eighth. You just divide by two every time you shift to the right. I want you to write down write down this on a piece of paper, the number nine, and shift it to the left one digit at a time. If you shift this to the left one digit at a time, you'll get from you go from a nine to an eighteen. You'll get a sixteen and a two. Then you go from the sixteen to a thirty-six. You get a thirty-two and a four. Most microprocessor instruction sets have commands called arithmetic shift left and logical shift rights. You'll see this in your microprocessor classes. So you can use shift registers to, to shift numbers to the right, to divide by powers of two, and to shift to the left, to multiply by powers of two. On page 171, if you take a look here, we got a 4-bit bidirectional shift register. If Here's your control signal, right slash left bar. 
right slash slash left bar right slash left bar that says when that's a signature there that's a signature when it's high it's shifting right when it's low it's shifting left I mean you'll see it on other signals like this you'll see a, a read slash right bar that'll be a signature in a memory device when it's high it's reading when it's low when it's high you're reading from memory when the signal is low when this line would be low it's writing to memory on this line right here when it's high you're right you're shifting right and when it's low you're shifting left so you should be able to take a look at uh, this right here and you should be able to look at this control signal right here and notice when read slash left when right slash left bar is a one when that's a one you're enabling gates G1, G2, G3, and G4, and you're basically taking the output and passing it on, and you're shifting data to the right. If, if this signal here is low, that low is going to disable G1, G2, G3, and G4, and it's going to enable G5, G6, G7, and G8. That's what it says up here. And what you do is taking this output and bringing it around to here, and taking this output and bringing it around to here, and taking this output and bring. You're shifting everything to the left when this line's low. Make sure you understand that. And then finally, on page 172, using two 74LS175 chips shown below here. How would you connect them together to create an 8-bit shift register? Note the 74LS175 is a 16-bit dual inline package where pin 8 is ground and pin 16 is VCC. These pins are not shown here. I didn't show you pin 16 and pin 8. But how would you connect these two chips together to get a 8-bit shift register? Take a look at it and let's see what you do here. Well, pin 13 is going to be your input. I mean, this is going to be your input where data is coming in. And then you would tie pins 12 and 15 together, right? You want to take the output of this flip flop and take it to the input of this one. Pins 5. And 10 you'd put together, pins 4 and 7 you'd put together, then you'd have to feed this output here of the last flip-flop to the input of the next package, so 2 to 13, pin 13 of the second package, then tie your 12 to 15 there, and your 5 to 10 there, and your 4 to 7 there, and this right here is your output here, your least significant bit. That makes this Q0. Here, let's take a look at it. That makes this Q0, Q1, Q2, Q3, Q4, Q5, Q6, and Q7. I took the two clears together, pins 1 in both packages. I just tied it together, and I pulled it up through a resistor to VCC so that it's not clearing the device. Then the clock I tied together. I took the clocks from these. It's on pin 9. I tied pin 9's together. And there's my clock input. So here's my input. This is my 8-bit shift right register. There's where my data comes in. Pin 13 of this package. Here's my clock signal. The clear. There's a clear low active. I just tie it high, so I disable it. And note I said here that pin 8 is ground. We didn't show it. And pin 16 is VCC. We're not even using the Q bar outputs, so I just let them go. You don't, we're not even dealing with them. You don't have, to, don't have to do anything with them. That's how you would create a 8-bit shift register using two 74LS175s. And that concludes this lecture.